Friends, I'm Dr. Malia Jones, the editor in chief here at Dear Pandemic, and I am very excited to be here this morning for our live Q and A with COVID experts with my co-founder Allison Buttenheim. Dr. Buttenheim is a behavioral scientist who studies how people make decisions about vaccines, among other things. And we are pleased to have you back. It's been quite a while since you've been on the show. How are you? It has. I'm great. I'm, you know, getting by January here in Philly. Um, yeah. Really, really thrilled to be doing this with you, Amelia. I like how it almost looks like we could be in the same room with our bookshelves, <laughs> our matching bookshelves. Yes. This is a background I steal from my spouse. This is his his background. But oh, uh, yeah. I, I booted him for, for Facebook Live today. Awesome. Well, we have a bunch of announcements to get started with this morning. Um, the first one is that I'm really excited to say that we are working on having live closed captioning and or American Sign Language interpretation on our Facebook Lives. And um, for, so for those of you who need closed captioning now, I realize it has not been working lately. And so if you need that, it would be best to watch this on our um, website for now. I think on January 26th, we're gonna to start to have live, live captioning. Um, another announcement, we are doing a survey of our followers. It's a scientific survey of who you are. We wanna know about uh, the pandemic and the spread of information in social media. And so we are inviting you, our watchers, to fill out our survey. And we're gonna drop the link to the survey. It takes about 10 minutes. And we're doing this in collaboration with our partners who run similar social media sites at your local epidemiologist and friendly neighbor epidemiologist. So we're really, really excited about this to sort we of We are really excited about it. Yeah. Who, who, who's out there and what do you need from us? Um, we also have a newsletter, um, which you can sign up for on our website and we'll drop the link in for that. And the newsletter comes into your email twice a week and it just highlights some of the most popular posts um, that we've, we've posted in the past week. Uh, so look for that. It's a nice way to just uh, have us come right to you without uh, you're having to come to us. And finally, before we dig into your questions, just a reminder that we don't take questions cold. Um, we like to go sort of hunt down some answers and make sure we're, we're saying the right thing. So the best way to get questions in for a future uh, Nerdy Girl Live show is using the question box on our website. And again, Gretchen will drop that link in too. So that's at dearpandemic.org. Uh, we have a very obvious place right on the landing place for you to send us questions. And we do read all of them and we use them to inform what posts we're gonna write about and what questions we're going to tackle in our live show. Yep, we use them for both. So that is very useful feedback for us. All right, so I get to ask you the first question. Bring it on. Gretchen from Dallas would like to know, this is actually a question tons of people have, and it's definitely in the news right now. She asks us, I'm due for my second Moderna shot on February 2nd, but I have no idea if I'll have access to it at that time. Will my second shot be just as effective if it's five or six weeks after the first one rather than four? Great question. And um, there are kind of two separate issues here. I want to address both of them. The first question is, you know, will Gretchen still be protected if her second dose is delayed a little bit? And the very easy answer is yes, it is okay. Um, we can drop link in, but the the you know the main the TLDR is you are protected from COVID. Even if the second dose is delayed, there's actually no outside time limit at which the CDC says you have to start your, your series over again. Um, and we know people are facing, you know, potential shortages for a second, that they're right at six or five at four weeks for Moderna. So go when you can, go as soon as you can after the three or four week mark, uh, but do not panic or worry if that's, you know, six weeks or even, you know, 10 weeks or 12 weeks. But the second thing I want to mention is like, why should Gretchen even have to worry about this? Aren't we supposed to be setting aside second doses in every location so that we know it's there, you know, with Gretchen's name on it, you know, it sort of feels like it's, it's supposed to work that way. Um, and unfortunately, there's just been a lot of wrinkles in the process of how allocations, reserves, how that distribution and delivery is happening all to, uh, to all of our local jurisdictions. Um, and we've been getting, frankly, kind of confusing news from the federal government and, and guidance and advice that has left the states and some local jurisdictions really, uh, really sort of confused. And they thought they were gonna get more doses and they thought they'd be ready with second doses. So I, th I think that'll get ironed out in the next few weeks. Of course, we also have a presidential transition happening on Wednesday. Yeah, I was just gonna bring that up. And Biden just yesterday released his plan plan for a vaccine yep. distribution. So, you know, I, 
I think we can expect some more bumps in the road as we yeah. transition to. Yeah, we'll have bumps. Um, he is planning to, you know, use the Defense Protection Act maybe to, to ramp up um, production. Uh, but there's, you know, there's glitches all along the system, the allocation, the delivery out to jurisdictions, the local onward allocation and delivery in arms. But rest assured, when you get that second dose, it will it will do the work for you um, that it needs to. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I, um, I'll bring up, we, of course, um, us collaborators on Dear Pandemic, we have a lot of back channel conversations about, um, about these issues. And of course, we have talked quite a bit about this, um, delaying the second dose as a strategy right. for getting more first doses into arms. And, and I think um, there's not a ton of agreement on what that looks like either amongst the Dear Pandemic girls or in the scientific community broadly, right? But one thing that's clear, um, I think that we do agree on is that the, the three or four week window for the second dose um, that was tested was somewhat arbitrary, yeah. right? Um, we think that probably it'll be just as effective, you know, it'll be just as effective if it's several weeks after that. And likely Moderna and Pfizer picked a pretty narrow window because they wanted to get the trial done. Exactly. Right? Um, and it's nice to, you know, have the shortest interval possible before you get the the boost from the second from the second dose, the immunity boost. Yeah. Um, so as soon as the second should... dose is available, then you should get it. And, you know, if it takes a little longer than um, than what it says on the on the vaccine package insert, then it's probably no big deal. Right. Probably not. You don't want to get it sooner than the three weeks or four weeks. That's, oh, yeah. that's important as well. And, and hopefully places won't even, won't even sort of entertain I was gonna, that, that yeah, idea. Um, and, and, you know, speaking of the Biden transition, his plan right now kind of re-ups commitment to a two-dose schedule. There, there aren't plans at this point to just sort of get way more people first dose and, and not worry about the second dose for a while. Um, well, we'll stay on the vaccine topic because, of course, it's hot. It's what everyone's been asking us about in the question box. Um, this specific question is from me, and it came up on our, our uh, Nerdy Girl Dear Pandemic Slack workspace uh, late last night um, as we were trying to think about, um, you know, how we get to herd immunity. So, you know, I study vaccine acceptance. I don't know all that much about how vaccines actually work. And my question to Malio is, you know, how soon do we start seeing drops in cases or, you know, a reduction in our R value, that, that sort of reproduction value as people start getting vaccinated? Is it right away or do we have to get to some sort of threshold before there's any population level benefit to these accruing vaccinations? Yeah. So th uh, this is a really interesting question. And, um, the discussion on it in the Slack channel has been really interesting. It's a little fringy, I think, in terms of what the <laughs> science can actually definitively say, because there are, there are quite a few unknowns here. And the, the question you have is really about, you know, do we expect to see like a linear mm -hmm. decline in cases or deaths or something, or is there a threshold? We do see a threshold, we do see threshold uh, effects happening for herd immunity. And, right. and by that, I mean that, um, you know, as we approach what, what looks like herd immunity, there will be like a sudden drop uh, in the number of cases in, the, in how well the disease can transmit through a population. Um, and so the question is, you know, do we see some threshold where another kind of threshold where we start to see um, cases or deaths declining? So um, I was thinking about this. I don't think science really has a like a definitive answer for this, at least that I know of, but I think it does highlight some tension in two of the competing philosophies about that can guide vaccine priority. Mm -hmm. And on the one hand, you know, I think we can put those who are at the highest risk for poor outcomes first in line to receive the vaccine. And we know that age is the main risk factor for hospitalization and death from COVID-19. So that would look like vaccinating people at older ages first. Um, on the other hand, we could put people who are the highest risk, risk for onward transmission right. first in line. And that would reduce the effective reproductive number and the number of cases, broadly speaking, which of course you can also imagine would prevent both cases and deaths, right? If we had zero transmission, then we would also have zero deaths. Um, but often those, those two groups are different. I think in some cases you, they're the same and, and those people have very appropriately been in the very first phase that, that would be people who live in nursing homes 
and um, healthcare staff who see patients face to face. Um, but you know, since we have limited supply of vaccines, we have to make we have to be really strategic about who else gets it first, um, or in order to get the most juice for the squeeze, as our common advisor Ann Pebbly likes to say. Um, so, you know. The question of when will we see a reduction in cases is it's a little dependent on whether vaccination prevents onward transmission at all. Um, I think I talked about this at length last week, actually, in response to a question from um, Kai. And I think what we, we can assume that the people who are vaccinated at least won't be like major contributors to onward transmission, right? They won't right. like turn into increased. Um, shedders of virus for any reason. So, so at least the vaccine, I think we can assume will suppress onward transmission. And, and if that's the case, then, um, then the number of cases should start to go down as soon as people's immunity kicks in. So every case of onward transmission prevented will be a case that never shows up in our, in our case incidents, right? So I was, on a, I was on a radio show with with Angie Rasmussen last week as a virologist from Georgetown, who we all admire and love. And, and she said, you know, given how much of a reduction in infection we get, it would just be so unlikely that there was no effect on transmission. Uh, so that, even though I we don't totally know the transmission, that. like it's yeah. just it's just likely that there's a big drop in transmission, too. Yeah, I think. Yeah, exactly. Is effective. That's what I said last week as effective as these vaccines have been at preventing symptomatic disease. It would be yeah. bizarre that they were it completely ineffective at preventing transmission, right? So so anyway, I think that how much will it go down is going to be, it'll be most responsive to the number of forward transmission events that are prevented. And these numbers are just not well defined. So um, I can't answer in this in a like truly empirical way, but I do think it'll help. Every vaccine that we give prevents some future cases and future onward transmission. When we prioritize people in older age groups, probably we're going to see a very sharp drop in deaths and hospitalizations, right? Um, we might see a slower decline in case incidents, right? But the pressure of you know dealing with the pandemic um, from a perspective of the hospital care, uh, hospital, the healthcare system burden and deaths will will start to go down. I think pretty quickly as we get older people covered. Um, and then thinking about the people who are highest risk for onward transmission is another way to strategize in terms of vaccine rollout. And, um, you know, probably have to start thinking about the extent that the new variant is here and is that yeah. gonna change our R number and, you know, analyzing those two things at the same time is really, is really hard. <laughs> really hard. So we'll just like hang out on Facebook and speculate about it instead. Okay. <laughs> so um, we are going to drop a link that that looks at this. We I couldn't find anything that tried mm. to examine this carefully in the United States, at okay. least in the window of time I had. So um, this is in the UK, but the, it is a little bit of a discussion about how soon can we see vaccines benefits. And it does highlight that the benefit we will see is going to be this really sharp drop in deaths, um, but maybe less of a sharp drop in case incidents, at least at first. Very cool. And, you know, okay. interesting, interesting, well, we should probably move on, but so much interesting questions about sort of allocation and who do we prioritize. There was sort of a Twitter kerfuffle yesterday when New Jersey announced that, you know, smokers were ahead of teachers and which is a very simplified, uh, you know, framework. And, you know, Lori Garrett tweeted that that was, you know, that was terrible. And, um, you know, do we, do we prioritize the folks who are going to who are going to get the benefits from reduced disease risk or, you know, the sort of social benefit of the, of the sort of frontline essential workers. It's very hard. It is hard. And I, you know, um, we have often highlighted this idea that science is not the same thing as policy. Mm -hmm. You know, there, we, science can say um, a lot of things that would inform policy, but policy really comes down to a lot of value judgments and it's yeah. very, it's very hard. I think I, um, I don't know, I often listen in on to the room where this, that sausage is made. And I am often grateful I'm not in it. <laughs> All right. Okay, so I've got the next question for you. All right. More on vaccines. Yeah. So this question comes from Janet in New York. And Janet says, what sources or advice do you have on the vaccine that really addresses the historical issues and mistrust for those of us who are black and brown? 
I'm worried about my older and high risk family members. There's a lot of distrust and I don't see how we will overcome it quickly. This is so important. Um, and you know, I'm here in Philadelphia having lots of different conversations with different health systems, the city, community-based organizations, all the folks that are you know, vaccinating healthcare workers now and soon will be vaccinating older folks and, and high-risk folks. And I think it's such a good example of how the COVID pandemic and sort of the new spotlight on the pandemic of structural racism, especially in healthcare, um, has really just brought these issues, uh, new urgency um, and, and new ways of thinking about it. So, um, you know, Malia, you and I work on vaccine acceptance and, and we're used to mostly thinking about like parents vaccinating their kids to go to school. And I will say, you know, we usually have very little <laughs> patience or tolerance for, for parents who are just like, nah, I don't feel like, you know, vaccinating my kid. And we feel like we have to get them better information and better, you know, social networks to support that. This is a really different problem. Um, and I think it's one we need to bring kind of new, new tools and new frameworks and new humility to. Um, so when we think about, um, you know, I think the, the question shouldn't necessarily be, how do we convince or persuade um, communities that are hesitant or reluctant to, to get the vaccine. I think it's much more about, um, you know, bringing a sense of, of humility and respect and curiosity, asking questions about what, what communities need or what they need to hear. Um, I think acknowledging past uh, just mistreatment by the medical research community, you know, decades, really centuries of that, um, and being really frank and honest about that. I heard the term, um, you know, justified distrust over the past several months, and most recently the term dignified just distrust, um, which I think really highlights the the importance of, of really listening to, to you know sort of where people are. In terms of you know programs or initiatives to address this, um, you know, I work from sort of a behavioral economics or nudge perspective. This is not a nudgeable problem. I've said mm -hmm. that a bunch in, in various um, sort of interviews and, and media outlets. This is sort of slow work and it's, it's work kind of recruiting um, really trusted leaders, whether that's, you know, clergy or, or peers or, you know, physicians or nurses who look like the communities that they're, that they're talking to um, and kind of sustained repeated one-on-one -on -one conversations and being okay with the answer being not yet for me. I don't want to be first in line here. Um, or, you know what, I'm giving this one a pass. Um, and, you know, for folks who are, you know, for folks who have strong, you know, reasons and, and aren't going to budge. I think that's kind of where we're going to be. For people who are on the fence, in addition to information and answering, you know, basic questions about, you know, were there enough people like me in the trials, for example, or, you know, is this going to change my DNA or can I get COVID from this? Those are, those are questions that have good answers. I think there's also an opportunity um, to use, you know, what we know from other behavior, you know, health behavior change science about making these behaviors, in this case, going and getting your vaccine really easy making feel really sort of popular and social and making it really fun. I'm, I'm really interested in sort of the science of delight. Um, and, you know, if you've been on social media for this issue, you know, you've seen like lots of selfies of um, especially, you know, black physicians and, and black healthcare workers um, talking about their reasons for vaccinating, why they're excited about it, why they're happy about it, what it means to them and their community to do it. There's a great hashtag, what's your why, which I like a lot and also black whys matter. I think is terrific. Um, and we're going to, you know, we're going to start seeing local media campaigns, maybe a national campaign will be coming from the Biden, the Biden um, administration. But we've already seen some really neat local campaigns that kind of hit all those buttons, you know, that make it a, a you know, really highlight the community benefit. Um, we're going to drop a link to a, a YouTube video that's an ad from New Orleans that I just love called you Sleeves Up so NOLA. <laughs> um, and it's really built around Mardi Gras. And like, what do we all need to do to get back to this thing we love, which is this community celebration. And you see lots of different folks and hear their voices about the 30 second ad, but they pack a lot of that kind of community benefit, um, people who look like me, what's your why, kind of the joy and the delight, um, which, I, which I think is really wonderful. So that's a long, that's a long rambly answer, but um, we, 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 are, we are absolutely obligated to do this work and um, to really hear the concerns that communities have and, and address them in, in, in authentic ways, I think. It has been really interesting to see, because as you said, you know, my, my pre-pandemic work focuses mostly on childhood Mm -hmm. vaccines that are mandatory for school and um, in general the people who are most reluctant to get those vaccines are, are very privileged 
Um, right. And it, it really is a problem of, of privilege. And one of the things that I study is how do um, people with privilege who refuse their vaccines, how does that decision uh, actually make health outcomes worse for people who are higher risk than they are due to social disadvantage. And, and so this has been a really new, um, a new perspective on yeah. the challenges of vaccine hesitancy and social justice and mistrust, because it's just not one that, um, that I think was in the scientific narrative really strongly before. It wasn't. And that, you know, one question I get and my research team gets a lot is like, you know, how do we find the trusted leaders? And, you know, there are a lot of existing organizations and networks. Um, you know, one example that comes to mind is the National Medical Association, which is an organization of Black physicians who are sort of advocates for their patients and their community. They have a great um, sort of Q&A, uh, just a statement about um, the phase three trials, answering some of those questions about, you know, were Black and Brown people included in those trials? In what numbers? And what did we learn about that? Are people with healthcare conditions that are more prevalent in Black communities, were they in the trials? And what did we learn from that? Them. Um, we'll put a link to that in the in the chat too. I think that kind of um, uh, you know statement from a really well trusted organization, highly regarded, um, can can go a long way. Yeah, to people. And that statement was addressed. emerged from an independent advisory committee, or I don't know what they called it, but a, a task force that that um, the National Medical Association actually um, formed specifically to make an independent comment on um, racial equity and the vaccine approval process. So it, it, um, one of the things I like about it is that it's not, you know, it's a separate um, endorsement right. from- It's not AMA, FDA, it's not FDA, and CDC. The AMA and the CDC. Absolutely. Um, well, please everybody go watch the Sleeves Up NOLA ad. I just, it I'm is, like, it I is lovely. just love it. <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll head into our last question, also about vaccines. And this is kind of a mashup of questions we heard from Lana in New York City, from Jessica in San Carlos, California, and Elizabeth from Pittsburgh. So we have a sort of trans US uh, question here. So what's the situation with a vaccine for children um, and basically COVID in kids generally? Can we expect a mask-free summer and fall? Is there any info on the rates of long COVID in children? any longer term health effects that we're seeing in kids who have been infected. And as adults start to get vaccinated, how do we think about COVID risks for kids like within the same household? Yeah. Um, timeline for COVID vaccine for kids. Where are we? COVID and kids and vaccines. COVID and kids. The, the quick summary. So I'm gonna start off with the bad news. Um, unfortunately, no, I don't think we can really expect a mask free summer and fall. Um, but I, that's, that's not mainly because of the timeline to a vaccine for children. It's, it's mainly for other reasons, which I will get to here. Um, developing the vaccines for kids will take quite a while. Um, Moderna recently made a, uh, had a press release saying they don't expect to have, a clinical, have clinical trial data on their vaccine in young children until 2022. Um, we, Essentially, the way trials in kids work is that we can't even start trials in kids until they've been shown to be safe in an older age group. And there's a ladder, an age ladder. So we start the trials in adults, healthy adults typically. And then um, we, we slowly work our way down this age ladder until we have a vaccine that's available potentially even for newborns. Uh, and it has to be shown to be safe in each age group. So we, we actually have to do a series of trials before we can get to a vaccine in young children. Um, Pfizer's vaccine has emergency use authorization for people who are 16 years and older. So the oldest age group of children was included in their, in their first major phase three trial. Uh, several companies, including Pfizer and Moderna, are now enrolling kids ages 12 to 18 in their trials. Uh, and we will expect to have to wait for the results of those trials before we can start on trials in younger age groups. Um, you know, one of the reasons for that is that vaccines might not work the same in children and might have different safety profiles in children. Kids' immune systems are not just miniature adult right. immune systems, they're different. So um, we, uh, the link I picked out here is from Kaiser Health News, and it, it actually presents sort of two different sides of this um, the vaccine trial in, in kids issue from pediatricians. And it, I think it highlights the 
um, the need to move quickly and but balances it with the need to prove that it's safe in younger and younger age groups in series. So that all said, I don't think we're going to have to wait until kids are fully vaccinated for things to start looking at least a little more normal. Okay. Um, we had a whole bunch of new studies on COVID risks and kids in these past, past couple of weeks here. And, you know, these are being broadly interpreted as um, it's safe for kids to be in school. I think we do need to qualify that a little. What these studies as a whole actually tell us is that when community spread is already low, schools don't make things worse mm -hmm. when they're in person. Um, as long as the students are wearing masks and we have a lot of other mitigation and measures in place. If community spread is also high, school, it's much less clear. That, it's, that is you know, such an important distinct. Can you just say that again? Like I, I, the fact yeah, that like, so, the importance of context here. Yeah, it is really key that we keep in mind, you know, community levels of COVID are the first thing we need to think about in terms of reopening schools, because um, when community spread is low, it looks like schools being open in person, K-12 schools being open in person do not lead to increased community spread. That's assuming the kids are wearing masks. Yep. There's some all extra the other space, mitigation all that measures. Other stuff. Yeah. When community spread is already high, it's much less clear. It's kind of all over the map. Sometimes schools do look like they increase community spread. Sometimes they don't, right? It's, so right. we have to have low community spread first. Um, you know, these questions about what happens when kids get COVID. Um, we are seeing more and more cases of COVID in kids, but they'll, they, they parallel more and more cases in adults. So it's not like the new variants are worse in kids or something. It's just that lots of people have COVID right now and a fraction of them are kids, right? So, um, so when kids get COVID, uh, the kids themselves are relatively, um, you know, as a rule, they recover. Uh, they are relatively low risk. And I'm going to say that in the context of like, we have a, a major a, a century level global health crisis. I'm not saying there's zero risk here, right? They're relatively low risk uh, for getting COVID. Some kids do get very, very sick with COVID. Um, we've had almost 700 pediatric deaths related to COVID in the United States, but that is a really rare outcome for children. Yeah. Um, especially as compared to older people. We've had a year to observe what happens to kids who've had COVID now, and it looks like there's really nothing to suggest that, that kids, um, that there's like some special long-term problem with COVID in kids, right? Um, rarely kids get this syndromic illness known as uh, multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children or MISC. That is very unusual. Um, there are some reports of long COVID in children, but this is very understudied. It seems to be a rare outcome and we know very little about it. So, you know, what does all this put together mean in terms of like, when are we going to get back to normal? Um, once I, here's my opinion. What I think once we get the people, the kids might transmit to covered, mm -hmm. especially mm -hmm. their grand, grandparents and their teachers um, their higher risk parents, then we could end up in a situation where we still have transmission among kids, but there it's just less urgent. The pandemic, you know, the seriousness of the pandemic will go down because we'll have um, very few hospitalizations and deaths and serious adverse events coming out of that. Um, also, I think that as the as more and more people are vaccinated, even kids circulating COVID amongst themselves might not be enough to really sustain the pandemic. Right. Certainly not on the scale that we have right now. Um, COVID is actually not like a super transmissible disease, and so just getting R RT the the transmissibility down a little by by getting some people vaccinated by getting most adults vaccinated will probably be enough to make the pandemic fizzle out. So well, there's that heterogeneity in transmissibility, big fancy words to say some people transmit a lot and like most people transmit yeah. not at all or a tiny bit. And it seems like it seems like kids are in that not at all or tiny bit right. bucket. Yeah, right. So if we could reduce the transmissibility, like, you know, if all the adults were no longer transmitting or transmitting only very rarely and the kids were still transmitting at the same rates that they seem to be now, I actually yeah. think that uh, this problem, you know, the pandemic would be like, kind of resolved at that point, even without a vaccine for kids. 
Okay. You know, so I, you know, that's going to take a while just to get the vaccine out to all those adults. And so I don't think we'll have a mask free summer and fall, but I yeah. do think that, you know, it's not like we have to hold our breath until a kid's vaccine comes out. Can a household change their behavior if the adults are vaccinated, but the kids aren't? What, what, what changes for a family of four where the adults have gotten it and the kids haven't? Anything? Yeah. Well, I think that um, until we see community rates really responding to widespread vaccination, we're all still going to have to maintain the same mm -hmm. precautions that we already have. You That's going to be hard for people. It is going to be hard because <laughs> I, you know, I mean, I'm going to be like last in line to get vaccinated, but yeah. once I do, I'm going to be really ready to throw a party and breathe on my friends. <laughs> so, you. but you know, we were talking about this earlier, like when can we start expect to start seeing cases go down? I, the more people who are vaccinated, the more we're going to start seeing that happen. And so I think that once we get to a point where there's very little disease circulating in the community, that's when we'll be able to um, relax some of our restrictions. And that's just dependent on, on vaccine coverage in the adult population. Right. Yeah. Right. So this is this interplay, this annoying interplay between individual behaviors and, and community issues. Very do you cool. have a different opinion on, on when, like, what, it, what does a family of four do if the adults are vaccinated and the kids aren't? Well, you know, the question I'm getting is if the adults have been vaccinated, can, like, can we plan a summer trip? Right. Oh. Like, can we, can we get on a plane? Can we have a family reunion? Can we, you know, yeah. do the things we would like to do? And, um, you know, uh, no. <laughs> yeah. I think uh, if I had, if I had a magic eight ball, it would be, it would be saying ask again later. I think we'll have to wait to see how vaccine rollout goes to answer that question. Yeah. Over these. You should get a magic eight ball, Malia. I'm going to, I ordered one last <laughs> night, Allison. Thank you for... <laughs> very good prop for an epidemiologist during the pandemic to have a magic eight ball. Yeah. Um, can I drop one more shout out in yeah. before we close? So um, there is a guy named Benji Renton who has been making various dashboards on Tableau, which is a really neat sort of data visualization platform. Um, all along the pandemic, he was tracking the White House outbreak in a really creative way, a lot of stuff on college campuses. Now he's got um, a terrific uh, vaccine allocation and distribution dashboard, which is the link um, we'll drop in. It turns out he is an undergraduate at Middlebury College. What? He's the, he you know, is? 20, yes, Benji Renton is a Middlebury undergrad. Shout out to Benji, who has been like doing this in addition to like being a college student. Wow. Um, really good. Uh, often, you know, the data are available somewhere else, but his presentation of it and visualization of it, you know, that's what I bookmark and, and go check. because Yeah, um, I had his um, White House COVID tracker yep. on like a hot link. <laughs> yeah, totally, totally. Um, so uh, his his Tableau link will take you to all his different dashboards and just one of our pandemic heroes on the data side, which I, I think is great. Awesome. Well, that is all we have time for today. So we get a lot of questions in that question box. We cannot get to them all, but I do want to tell you, we read every single one of them and we use them not just for this Q&A, but also to inform what we're going to post about in the next week. So Please do go, do go to our website and put your questions in the question box. While you're there, you can also search for it. We may have answered it already. We have answered a lot of questions. And I want to thank you for joining us. So um, I'll be here at the same time next week, Saturday at 930 Central. And next week, I'm going to be joined by the fabulous Dr. Jennifer Dowd. And uh, so maybe Jen and I will get extra nerdy. That's going to get super nerdy. <laughs> talk about denominators or something. Love it. <laughs> okay, well, until then, please have a great safe. weekend, everybody. Yeah, stay sane.